Welcome back to Disquiet Time. This is Anne and Kelly, and this week we have a special guest. Natasha, do you want to introduce yourself? This is Natasha, and I'm from Russia. I know Anne and Kelly from way back in the U.S. and way back. Uh, <laughs> and so we, I think we met what, like, twenty years ago on a was it Halloween, like a zombie a hayride or something like that? Oh, that <laughs> yes, yeah, it probably was seventeen, eighteen years ago. Yeah, and it was a yeah. spooky beginning. <laughs> and, and it got scary and scarier from then on. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, true. So, and there's a reason we brought Natasha in, other than she's super cool, is that this week, or this month, we are going to be talking about the Dyatlov Pass incident, which happened in Russia in 1959. So, and I kind of want to get her perspective on it and some of her ideas, because, because a lot of this, of course, has entered popular American culture and as I was doing my research, I found a lot of things that were just repeated from person to person without any proof. So it's like somebody said it once and then everybody's picked it up since then. So I'm really curious to see what's different, you know, how, how our two different perspectives are. And if it is still really just kind of this weird incident. So, all right. But. I'm going to do first is I kind of want to go through everything that I found kind of in chronological order, get a little perspective on what was going on at the time, and then we'll get into the weirdness. All right. Now, this incident takes place sometime between February 1st and February 2nd of 1959. So it was overnight sometime that this happened. And nine Russian hikers died in what became the Dyatlov Pass incident. Right now, a bit of history for some perspective. This was taking place during the Cold War and also the space race. Right, so this was a part of history where the Americans and the Russians kind of had a whole lot of stuff going on between them, and there was a whole lot of like military type of activity, especially in more remote areas like this that was going on. So there were some weird things, and in the past. Um, like just previous to this incident, this whole area where this took place was known as kind of an industrial complex. So this wasn't like remote abandoned. It was just remote because it's incredibly mountainous, but then everywhere else there was a lot of people. Um, so now I'm going to need some help with pronunciations. I don't want to butcher it too badly, um, but the Dyatlov Pass is in um, the area called the all right, here we go and try it. So, Sverdlovsk, Sverdlovsk. Yeah, that's correct, and that's Yekaterinburg at the at the at the moment because it used to be Sverdlovsk in the times of the Soviet Union, and then it got renamed back into its Russian Empire oh. name. Yeah. Oh, so what's it called now? I think it's um, Yekaterinburg. Let me check. Okay, that's okay. correct. It used to be Sverdlovsk, and now it is Yekaterinburg. Yekaterinburg oh, yes, is the city okay, of Catherine, so the, the, the city. Catherine the Great. Ah, gotcha. Okay, okay. Yeah, because I saw that. Yeah, that Yekaterinburg was the main city there, and that's kind of where they left out of, actually. I think a lot of them were students at different universities or, you know, were somehow affiliated with universities located in Yekaterinburg. Yes, that is one of the things I found is that they were associated with, and I'll find it here in my notes in just a minute, with um, uh, the, the Ural Polytechnic Institute. It's now called the Ural State Technical University or something like that. So, yeah, so this is in the Ural Mountains. Um, so it's, you know, of course, very high. The Ural Mountains are um, kind of what divide Western Russia from, you know, the, East, the European part of Russia from then the Eastern part, the Asian part of Russia. So they're, they're big, they're high, they're quite an obstacle, and they're considered a challenge. So, and I think they're still very popular, from what I could tell, for these types of wilderness hiking trips. I'm thinking I would not have chosen February to go hiking there, to be perfectly honest. Well, actually, that is part of why they chose it, because this is what's interesting. Um, 
they are all they were all considered grade two skiers and hikers um, and that this trip not only the length of the trip but the difficulty because of the time of year it was what was going to raise them up to a grade three which is the highest certification you could get so they did this on purpose <laughs> so they, they knew what they were getting into uh-huh so I think they've uh, all had prior experience in like of uh, similar hiking trips. Though yes. they, they they've all have they they've all had the hiking background. Yes. Yeah. So these were not newbies. These weren't people just kind of going out there like this will be fun and snowy. They knew what they were doing, which makes some of the things that they found in the end kind of weird. You know that they that they reacted in kind of funny ways. Um, so this is a, a pretty big area. From what I can tell, looking at the, the population and the, the square footage, this whole area is a little bit bigger than the state of Missouri. So we know that's pretty large and has just a little bit fewer people. So it's, it's a pretty big area. It's not completely isolated by any means. Um, now, the group was composed mostly of current and recent graduates of this Polytechnic Use, uh, Institute, though there was one outlier. He was a 37-year-old World War II veteran, and he was supposed to have joined another group, also trying to get this grade three certification, but for some reason he wasn't able to go with them, so he got added on to this group. All right, so he was just kind of thrown in there. All these other people were friends, they knew each other. He was a bit of an outlier. Um, which may or may not be important. Some of the theories kind of revolve around him being an outlier, but it just could be because something weird happened. If nothing weird had happened, he'd never have come up again. Um, so what they had to do to get this grade three is they had to go over 300 kilometers. Right, so they had to be able to pass from one place to another over 300 kilometers in these snowy cold conditions. Now this route was registered and approved by the um, the areas, this Sverdlovsk, Sverdlovsk, sorry, I keep saying it wrong, City Route Commission. So they, they actually had a whole commission set up to approve these routes. And they were issued a route book. And at that point, that route book, and this is kind of strange, was issued for 11 people instead of 10. So, but 10 people started out. I don't know where this 11 per person came from. Nobody ever said who this 11th person was. Or where they came from but they started out as a group of 10 let me comment on that um i've read that uh, there was a lot of um uh, fluidity in terms of you know people uh bailing at the last moment because of like a scheduling oh, conflict oh. or you know maybe they wanted uh to take like a faster route a longer route or maybe their friends they they found out their friends were going so, you know, that was quite common that people okay. would drop out at the last moment or um, it is or also get added in <laughs> like this guy. Or, so yeah, this, exactly. route book, this route book, did it get, list names who was supposed to be on this trip? I don't know. Did say 11 people? I don't know. Uh, I don't know either. That's I, I never saw it. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but also... Um, it is possible that there were some problems with equipment because a lot of these groups were not, um, well, they were not like professional. So they were getting mm -hmm. whatever they could get like that. One of the problems that the group encountered was that they did not have like a radio receiver with them. Things could have gone a lot better, you know, could have oh. ended a lot better had they had that, but just that equipment was not available in 1959 to all of the groups on the route. And that so, would have been too much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So possibly I never people even thought dropped out. That. Yeah, it's possible people dropped out just because they did not have, you know, the warm clothing, you know, and the kind of skis mm -hmm. and whatever they required in order to um, complete this kind of. Um, so they uh, were experienced route. but not professional. They didn't have top grade equipment and stuff always. And no equipment was provided for them then. This was entirely on their own. Sounds well, like it. some of the equipment was provided and some, I know that the tent, they actually, uh, Dyatlov designed the tent and they kind of put it True. together yes. <laughs> on, on their own. So a lot of that stuff, like some, they got the professional stuff and some stuff they made themselves, you know, and just had to make do with whatever was available. Gotcha. Okay. Because, I mean, think about when you're in college, I wouldn't have had the money to buy supplies for an expensive camping, hiking trip. I mean. Yeah. 
Not be like, hey, that sounds cool. cool. Sign me up, and then be like, I have to buy what? Yeah. No thanks. Yeah. So it sounds like there was a lot of fluidity of this, but by the time they set off on January 23rd, they had 10 people with them. So, and their goal was to make it to this um, Otortum Mountain. Um, so that was that was the goal. They're supposed to make it there and back again. And that was going to get them cer their certification. Now, I have a list here of the 10 people who started out. And the first one, of course, was Igor Dyatlov. He was the leader of the party. This is who the incident then is named after. He was 23 years old. And these others, I'm just going to do their first names um, just because I, I don't really want to butcher everybody's name. I'm so sorry. But um, then we had, well, we had our first Yuri, Yuri D, we'll call him, and he was 21. Then we had, and per, 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 correct my pronunciation at any time. Um, then we had Ludmila, she was 20. And then I believe this would be Georgie, and he was 23. Alexander was 24. Zineda was 22. Rustam was 23. Nikolai was 23. So all very, very young. And then Yuri Y. And he was 21. So, but that's that's going to be a little bit. He's going to be our one who drops out. And then finally, our add-on was Semyon. Would that be correct? Semyon? Semyon? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay. And that's he was 37. He was a sports instructor working on his master's degree, but he was also a World War II veteran. Yeah, and the funny thing about this Simeon person is that in different notes he wrote a different name, like in some notes he goes by Simeon, and I think in others he goes by Alexander. Oh, another Alexander. And the, yeah, so it's kind of, and it's kind of funny that the same person has, you know, uses the same last name, but uses different first names mm. to refer to himself, and that's kind of the beginning of um, that theory that, that talks about you know yeah the, the mystery that kind uh, of okay, like, I, had well, heard that. I had heard that because there's the two Yuri's and that that's the last the, I had heard something about this recently that somebody had said yes but then there were sort of two Alexanders yeah right well and then there's also later that's going to come into it I'll, I'll bring it up later that something else weird about his identity comes up okay so there is something else very strange. So, but they started out as a set of 10 and, you know, they leave this uh, Yekaterinburg and, you know, at first they travel by train. They also travel by truck. At one point, it's even like a horse and sleigh until they get to the point where they're going to begin the actual hike. And so on January 27th is when the hiking portion began. So they left on the 23rd, this is the 27th. But after just one day on the 28th, Yuri Y, the 21 year old, turns back. Um, he had a congenital heart defect and he also had rheumatoid arthritis. And well, this he, was a terrible idea for him. Yeah, and he was just hurting too much and he knew he was gonna hold the group back. So he decided to turn back. So now they're down to nine. So that's how we went from 10 to nine. So, um, so he was in pain, but what no Dyatlov told him was that we expect to be at our, you know, to, at the mountain by uh, February 12th. But, you know, because of weather and stuff, don't worry if it's, there's a few days leeway in there, but I'll send you a telegraph. So they must have had like telegraph equipment with them. Oh, I think it's the, the end point of their journey where they were supposed to come to a place that had the telegraph. Where oh, the they telegraph was telegraph. there. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And there were towns. There were towns along the way. There were a couple of places where they could could interact with people. I think what, weren't there? I don't know. That never came up. Oh, okay. I may be misremembering that with something else. Um, I listened to too many podcasts. So. Well, I think they encountered some people as they were coming to that final point point where they parted ways with this one guy. You know, who mm -hmm. went back because he wasn't feeling well. They um. They've slept um, at a high school, you know, and had a great time with people yes. in that small place, singing songs, you know, playing the guitar. And then they moved to this place, which I think is an abandoned uh, prison camp, because there are a lot of those, like, parts Ooh. of the gulag system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a spooky place, and if you look at the photos, uh, because a lot of people um, in the group had cameras with them, yes. and they were taking pictures. 
and if you look at the pictures it's it's kind of spooky you know because it's it's an abandoned place it used to be i think it used to be a mine oh, and so that and that's where they spent the, the night before they set out on on the route okay that does explain i did see the pictures and i could see like structures behind them but I couldn't tell. I didn't know within the background who was a group member or if there were other people. I couldn't tell. So they're at this kind of semi-abandoned area right before they set out. Yes, but that that, that area used to be a part of the log log as a part nice. of the log. So yeah, it was a part of the so uh, creepy Russian, start. What, like the pen penitentiary system, right? Yeah. Like the, the punishment, yeah, for yeah, for you prisoners. You have to go and work work camps. Yeah. That's probably what I was thinking of then when I was thinking of that there was a town or something nice. that they had. Oof, that's actually a really creepy start to this. That's, yeah, I'm not sure that that would uh, set set me up with, with a good frame of mind for this. Well, especially since the very first part of the hike, when they go up, they're heading up a mountain called Kolat Tikal, which in the local Mansi language means dead mountain. Yeah. There were omens everywhere on this trip. I'm saying. <laughs> so, yikes. But, um, so yeah, okay, so they let Yuri heads back. Yuri Y heads back. They head up. Um, and just as it starts to get steep, that um, they found that they had uh, stashed a whole bunch of the equipment right there at the base because they meant to use it then on their way back as they came back down that was you know extra equipment they didn't want the extra weight you know but they did take their journals they did take their cameras lots of pictures they took tons of pictures of each other and stuff in the landscape and you know typical young kid on a cool hiking trip stuff um so in the journal indicates from what i've read that the journals were uh, it was all very normal stuff like oh we're excited we, we don't know what we're going to see we don't know what's going to happen this is really cool and then you know a couple of spats were recorded like well this person isn't pulling their weight and you know typical get a bunch of kids together and put them in under physical dress and you know just normal spats so they're heading out and they have to head up the side of this mountain this Colette Sikal, and they're trying to head through a pass. At this point, it's not named the Atlov Pass. I never found what the actual name was. Maybe it was just called the pass. I don't know. But they're heading through Mansi territory, which they're known to be peaceful. There's no previous, oh my gosh, this is a dangerous thing to do. Um, but they're the, the native population of here. But this comes into some of the theories later is why I mention it. Um, so at this point, they're heading up, but the weather's getting bad. So instead of going straight up and through the pass, they kind of veer off a little bit, I think to the west, um, about one and a half kilometers. They're, they're not going quite straight like they'd planned to, but the weather's getting really bad. Weather's important in this. And they make the fateful decision that instead of going down further into the tree line, which is you know about another, like I said, one and a half kilometers away, they're tired, they're cold, the weather's worsening. They decide to camp right there on the side of the mountain. So they cut away a little bit of the snow, set up this tent that like you mentioned, um, Igor is the one who designed this tent. He was he was known as a very resourceful leader and, and, and well-versed in all this. He had designed this tent and he also designed the stove system, the heating system inside of it. So there's a stove with a pipe that comes out the front for the exhaust of the stuff and he designed all of that so it's this cool homemade system and they set it all up and this is where things get all to be conjecture because they 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 wrote in their journals and everything was cool everything was fine uh, and also they took a couple of pictures you know of how they're yes. setting up the tent and what it yes. looks like so it all looks perfectly normal Yes, it all looks normal, exactly. There's nothing indicating anything is strange. Now, later, I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the photographs because fire and burning comes into it. So we'll talk about that, but the, that system. But yes, everything is normal. There's nothing weird. Pictures of each other, pictures of goofing around. And now, well, something else I think I should bring up right here is that at the beginning of the trip, it was indicated that they were being extremely health conscious. There was only one small flask of medicinal alcohol, no drugs, no cigarettes even. They were being absolutely clean. But some of these theories at the end indicate that 
a majority of them were intoxicated at the time of this incident, which I don't know if that's true or not or how anyone determined that. So, but we'll talk about that later. But everything's normal, having a good time, get everything set up. They ate a meal because after they've been found, after the incident is found, they, the last meal had been six to eight hours earlier. So they had a meal. There was some cooked bacon in the tent. Everything was fine. And then at some point, something went wrong. We don't know exactly what. So here's Yuri waiting for this telegraph and it doesn't come. He's like, no big deal. We know the weather has been bad up there. We'll wait. And the weather that night is horrible up there. But he says, we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. And he doesn't get anything for it like a week. And he's like, okay, I'm starting to worry at this point. Then the other hikers' families start to get worried. And finally, the school sends out a rescue team. Okay, what's going on? At this point, they're expecting to find them alive and just stuck somewhere. They send them out. They find the stash of stuff at the foot of the mountain. And eventually, they find the tent. Okay. Now, following the same route that they had intended, you know, so they'd stayed mostly on route. This is how they found them on February 26th. So three weeks after whatever happened, they find the rescuers find the tent and it's partially buried in snow. That's important. Was it buried because of snowfall? Did they per partially bury it on purpose? Um, it has a large cut in one side of the fabric. And there is a flashlight that had been left turned on on top of it. Now, one source I saw claimed that when they came and found it, that the tent had been set up improperly. But that seems weird to me because Dyatlov himself is the one who designed it. Why would it be set up improperly? I, I think they just didn't understand since it was a homemade tent how it was supposed to be set up or something. But there was only one source I saw that. But someone indicated it wasn't set up properly. So at this point, they're like, well, where is everybody? Nobody's in the tent. But they see their shoes and they see their personal gear. And they start looking around. In an emergency, the tent could, the stove could have been, you know, misaligned somehow or... Right. It very well could have. And that's going to feed into some of the theories. Uh, but the tent itself was not burned. Uh huh. J just w one one comment. When some people are saying that the tent was not set up properly, what I read was that uh, they were kind of, you know, uh, well, it's it's a mountain side, mm -hmm. right? And there's yes. snow there, so they dug into the snow to um, to put up, right? Just so that they have even ground mm -hmm. and the tent is not tilted. It's and flat, so some yeah. people, yeah, yeah. So people. Um, have that's not the best way to set it up when the wind is really strong and when there is like large snowfall so you know when maybe i don't know but so maybe that comment when... might be based more on how they dug it into the snow than rather how the actual tent was set yeah because oh. i think you know they were saying they they put the skis underneath the tent you know to make kind of like the foundation mm -hmm. uh, they use some um, sticks and um, more skis to kind of pull the ropes uh, you know, to make sure the tent uh, is all spread out and doesn't collapse. And the fact that the tent was found, what, like three weeks later, and mm -hmm. part of it was still standing, kind of tells it um, tells us it was set up properly as in, mm -hmm. you know, it was set up to last. Absolutely. That, see, that's what I think. It was still there. <laughs> so, but I, and maybe you're right. Maybe it's because of the cutting into the snow, and that comes into some of the theories later, the cutting into the snow and what that could mean. Um, and what that could have done to them. So I think this is a good place to stop and come back for a part two.